are listening to The Itch, a podcast exploring all things allergy, asthma, and immunology. I'm your co-host, Courtney, a real-life allergy, asthma, and eczema girl. And I'm your second host, Dr. Payal Gupta, a board-certified allergy, asthma, and immunology doctor. Courtney and I hope to balance each other out so that we get you all the information that you want and need about allergies, asthma, and immunology. darling itch listeners it's courtney and we are on episode 14 if you can believe it we're taking a little pause on asthma and we're gonna head into some allergy content for the next couple of weeks but biologics are coming we promise we're gonna talk more asthma but what we did want to do is just take a little break and jump back into food allergies we have a lot of exciting content coming to you especially something we recorded at fab blog con because we interviewed the one and only dr ruchi gupta Um, But for today, what we're going to do is we're jumping into an interview with an allergy mom, Shala, from my Berkeley kitchen, and we talk a lot about food, food allergies, cooking, and finding ways to empower your children in the kitchen. We also talk about new foods when you're feeling nervous and are restricting your diet, how to get out of that, and how to dine out because there are ways to do it with food allergies, so we give you some of our tips. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Hi everyone, we are talking with Shala from My Berkeley Kitchen today. I met Shala through Instagram, which you will find is a common theme here um, with most of our guests. But Shala and I have known each other now for three or four years, three years I'd say, because I think I've only been on Instagram for like maybe over three. Um, And I've actually visited her Berkeley Kitchen in real life and we've cooked together. So I'm excited to have Shala here. Um, I will pass it on to Shala and let her introduce herself a little bit about her blog and just tell us quickly about how you're in the atopic world. So hi Shala, welcome. Hi, ladies. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so delighted and honored to be here, providing us such wonderful programming so far. Thank you. So I started, uh, let's see, I started my Berkeley Kitchen probably, I want to say it's been four or five years now. And our journey started about five years ago. Um, I enrolled in a culinary program uh, that was a local school here in Berkeley called Bowman College. And it's a school that focuses on holistic nutrition, specifically uh, focusing on how to cook for people with allergies and uh, dietary requirements and uh, health conditions. And it, Back then, it was a coincidence when I enrolled because my kids did not have food allergies. But Syra has always struggled with uh, eczema, and she also had some undiagnosed health issues early on. And so we kind of tweaked her diet. And because of that, we saw some changes. And so I just got fascinated with the connection between food and nutrition. And so... uh, when I enrolled in the program, two weeks into it, both my kids ended up into, in the hospital two weeks apart from each other. And Syra had uh, pneumonia, which ended with a uh, asthma, asthma attack. And she ended up in the hospital f- uh, for five days. And then Alina uh, had her first anaphylactic reaction. Uh, we had given her a piece of pie that, unknown to us, was made with hazelnuts. And so, as you can imagine, our world just completely flipped upside down. And I didn't know if, first of all, I didn't know if I would return to the program, let alone how this, how all of this would impact our wor- our world and how I would go about taking care of them. So... Wow. Yeah, it was quite a ride. So after I finished, I actually did finish the program. And I was very grateful because my husband and my family rallied around me. And I'm so grateful to finish because it really laid a foundation for me to understand food. You know, I was not a cook before I started the program. And I was always interested in food. My, You know, I came from a really large South Asian family. And my mom is a phenomenal home cook. So um, I always understood the importance of cooking. But when I was a new mom, I relied a lot on takeout. And 
as Syra sort of developed eczema and had these sort of undiagnosed health issues, I realized the importance of home cooking. And so I just really wanted to understand food better. And that's why I decided to, you know, kind of focus on it. And so I started blogging because after I finished the program, I realized that I had to sort of adjust to this whole new way of keeping them safe. And with Alina, it was so imperative that I learned that so quickly because she had anaphylactic food allergies. And with Syra also, um, I knew nothing about asthma or food allergies. Like food allergies didn't run in our families. We didn't know anyone with food allergies. And actually our story, when I was listening to your podcast with Meg, our story is very similar in that you know, we just didn't grow up with food allergies. Um, and so I think for us, it was just such a, such a wake up call for us to sort of learn this. And, you know, when your child is diagnosed with food allergies, you don't have the luxury of sort of, you know, trying to figure it out because each bite is important. And so for me, I just felt like I had to get into the kitchen. That was sort of my safe zone. Yeah. So lots of, lots of important information or questions that I have for you, actually, because um, your story is so, wow, it's so beautiful how things kind of happen at the right time in your life. You know, you decided to do this cooking course kind of out of nowhere, but it provided so much to you and your family that you had this knowledge and for you to really be able to take care of a diagnosis that people often get overwhelmed with. So I, that's why I think it's so interesting that there's so many food allergy moms become these amazing at-home chefs. Like you said, it is a big yeah. deal to be, be a parent. And I think people try to make it easier in so many different ways and takeout is one of those ways. And so um, that's what I was talking to Courtney about that I was really excited to talk to you because we didn't really go into that as much with Meg. And I really wanted to talk to you about it. Just focus on, you know, how have, has cooking changed the diagnosis for you? How has that impacted what your children are learning and how you're teaching them to cook at home and all of that kind of stuff. So I just think it's so beautiful and such a, a nice way to take something that is difficult and make it into something that's a cool lesson for your kids, just teaching them how to cook and make delicious things for themselves so that they don't feel, I guess, left out of the foodie world. Thank you so much. I mean, that means a lot. I think, you know, like I said, I was not a cook. My mom was the cook in the family. And so I didn't really have a reason to learn how to cook other than appreciating food. And becoming a mom changed that for me, obviously. But then, you know, the health issues uh, came about and we just had no choice, really. You know, it was a way of keeping our kids safe. And I felt really lost and alone when I, we first started. And I think that I just poured my heart into looking online and, you know, following different groups on Facebook and researching things. And I also tell people that with Alina, it was with both of the girls, but specifically with my youngest and her food allergies, it was such a journey. Like her allergies, we didn't know that much about them. And it took us years to understand what she was allergic to and how severe the allergies were. And we just didn't know, you know, when she had her first anaphylactic reaction, we thought, okay, we're going to take her to the allergist. And then he tested her for nuts. And then we went home and I thought, okay, well, she's anaphylactic to all nuts except all almonds. But we didn't know anything else. We didn't even think that she could be allergic to other foods. And it wasn't until a year later when she had a reaction to sesame that we realized like, wow, this is more complicated than we could even imagine. And we better get her tested for even more foods. And so, you know, being in the kitchen just was imperative for me because I felt like it was at that time, it was the only safe place for us and cooking with whole foods. And I think just being in the kitchen so much, our kids didn't have a choice but to be in the kitchen with us, you know, and I had such a love for food that I didn't want to pass on that fear to my kids. I wanted it to still be a celebration of food. And I knew that this was going to get even more complicated as they got older. And so I tried not to pass that on. I just tried to pour my heart into cooking and, you know, focusing on the foods that we could eat. Yeah. Interesting point that you just brought up was getting tested for the most common foods initially, which is what we do. I think we've talked about this before, but you don't want to over test because of the false positive rates. 
right. but you don't, you know, so we focus on the most common initially. And then I get how it could be nerve wracking for patients and parents when all of a sudden there's another food that their child reacts to. So sesame now is becoming more common, but probably when you were initially being tested, it wasn't as common of a phthalogen. So we weren't necessarily testing it right off the bat. Now I think most allergists do test sesame off the bat too. So as we learn more, we do more, but how much were you then restricting your your family's diet once you got that second diagnosis of sesame allergy? Yeah, the sesame allergy really changed the way that we ate because it was scary. She had a contact reaction to sesame. She never ingested sesame. She had that contact reaction twice. So I had cooked, I had made like a tahini sauce and she hadn't eaten it, but Matt, my husband had eaten it and then touched her face and her face just ballooned. And she was fine with, you know, we gave her some Benadryl, but the second time she ended up in the hospital from a trace contact of sesame. So she's very allergic to sesame, never ingested sesame, but that uh, it just awakened so much in us because we really had to change and redefine how we managed her allergies. And so my goal was to get her back into the allergist and think of all of these other foods that she could be allergic to. And that included like spices, you know, because I come from a South Asian family, we cook so much with different spices. And so I started going online and people were sort of indicating, well, there's this cross reactivity amongst foods. And that sort of put me into a place where I thought, well, gosh, I should, you know, get her tested for this. And really, there wasn't that much direction that we were being given by our allergist or by her pediatrician about this cross reactivity with foods and testing her for the top eight allergens. She was actually eating peanuts and um, almonds and cashews pretty regularly as a child before she you know, was tested. So that's why all of this was sort of alarming to us that she was allergic to all these other nuts. At first we thought, oh, it's just hazelnut. And then the more we found out about it, the more we realized that this is a bigger issue. And looking back at her pictures now, we realized that she always had some sort of redness on her face. And when we would take her to the doctor, the doctors would notice it as well, but it just got passed off as being eczema. And so we never thought twice about it. But now when we look back at pictures, we thought, my gosh, could that have been some sort of reaction that was happening that we just didn't clue in on? Because she was eating nuts and nuts were being used in our diet regularly. Just to clarify, though, she has been definitely diagnosed as having an allergy to all tree nuts yes. and all, peanuts. All tree or- nuts and that accept almonds. She's had blood and skin testing in multiple times. Peanut, we thought that her levels were, um, you know, acceptable enough to do an oral challenge. And we tried the oral challenge three times and she didn't, she didn't pass it. In fact, okay. she had a reaction that went up her back and we had to stop it uh, pretty early on. It was just through contact at that point. So they point. did the component testing and she was positive to that. Okay. So yeah, fortunately, I think maybe we talked about this is that when infants are tiny, their initial reaction is really just the eczema. And then as they're exposed to it more, then they can develop the other systemic symptoms like the swelling of the face, the throat, the wheezing, all of that kind of stuff. So initially, thankfully, the reaction is usually just of the skin. And so it's usually not an anaphylactic reaction as the initial reaction. I think that pediatricians are definitely becoming more educated on the fact that Eczema in an infant equals get tested for allergies. But almost every other day, I have a child, an infant that comes in that's had eczema for several months that has not been tested yet. I think there is still a disconnect between that association of eczema sent to an allergist or eczema at least do the initial blood test. Have we talked about that before, Courtney? Yeah, we addressed this with the atopic march. So we talked about if the skin's, if the eczema is not getting better, 
then the next step would be allergy testing. Not just if it's not getting better. Any signs of eczema is what I what I tried to tell my friends or a pediatrician. Any signs of eczema, you need to do an initial screening test through serum IgE testing, which we've talked about. And, and then if there's any positives, then you send to an allergist because then we take the serum IgE testing and the skin testing and correlate the two with the symptoms also and the exposure and then we put everything together, all the information that we have to give an accurate diagnosis and also give an EpiPen when appropriate. It's super, super important point that, you know, I don't know how many pediatricians are going to be listening to this podcast, but it's for the par- parents who have kids with eczema that need to be aware of this, spread it to their friends who might have kids with eczema, that they should ask for it. I think that um, Shala brought up an interesting point about cross-reactive foods. I know that that can become something really fearful for, and like, especially now that you can Google like, oh, like if I see um, an ingredient that I've never seen before, I'll Google it and see what family it's in and whether it's something I should go ahead and try or whether it's something I should avoid and maybe talk to my allergist about at some point, because it might be related to a legume or it might be related to a sesame in some way. And so I get fearful that I could react. Can we talk a little bit about cross-reactivity in foods? Is that something that you talk to your patients about? When we're talking about cross-reactivity in foods, what I think of is oral allergy syndrome. What I think of is cross-reactivity between tree pollens and certain foods. And because certain foods have similar proteins to the tree pollen that people might be allergic to. And so they have something called oral allergy syndrome, which is where they might have itching in their mouth related to a food that comes off of trees or comes out of the ground that the body is like, oh, wait, is she eating a tree? And then you get that itching. But usually in those situations, it doesn't lead to an anaphylactic reaction. That's a whole separate thing, right? Now on the internet, I'm sure I could Google any food and say cross-reactivity. And people have created these lists that I don't know how they've been generated, quite honestly. And they've created these lists that now people are going to and getting nervous about, especially even the spice issue. We don't, I don't test for spices normally. And there's not really good IgE testing as far as I know, or cardamom, turmeric and things like that. I don't normally do that. And people aren't allergic to salt and pepper. And that's not a common allergy. And in fact, I've never seen a patient that's truly allergic to a spice. And so, you know, there's so many things that we, as people that aren't in the medical field, I totally get it. I would be nervous too. And the difference is some of the Indian spices, they actually probably grind up nuts and put it in the garam masala. So you have to look at the ingredients. And so in that situation, that's totally different. That that's not just one component or one thing. You're talking about multiple different ingredients that they're putting all together and calling it a masala or a spice. That's a totally different concept. And in that situation, yes, I would worry. I would look at the contents. That I'm assuming that certain Indian brands are now saying this is what's in our garam masala. But as far as being allergic to salt and pepper, you know, that's not that's not something that I particularly worry about with my patients. I think for me, it's like a jealousy. It looks suspiciously similar to a sesame seed. So it's also this thing about like, oh my gosh, that looks exactly like something that can send me to the hospital. I'm going to avoid it. You know, or I think Shala and I have talked about like chia seeds, you know, because I have a sesame allergy as well. And it's like, I would love to try chia seeds, but there's like just something holding me back. And that makes total sense that you would worry about that. But we have no correlation to indicate that a chia seed and a sesame seed have the same proteins at all. I have patients that have sesame allergy that still have lots of other types of seeds. And so I get it. And I think that as an allergy community, we need to be more sensitive to these issues and look more deeply into the things that might affect our patients. And so this is another topic that I think the allergy community needs to be aware of. And we need to and create some kind of a a document that we all can use so that it's all validated, very specific information. Is that something that you think would be helpful? I think it would be so helpful because like I said, when we first started learning more, especially after the sesame diagnosis, we were put into this place where we were thinking, well, what is safe for her? Like, can we use 
uh, a five spice can, you know, we, in our house, even before the allergies, we cooked with a lot of different foods. So I was grateful that we had exposed her early on to, you know, a whole range of different spices and foods. And so I felt comfortable in what we had given to her before. But now I almost feel like, you know, there are a lot of things she hasn't had before. And people have allergies to pine, like she hasn't eaten pineapple. And I'm kind of restricting that and thinking, gosh, you know, I don't want to give her pineapple at home. And then what if she has a reaction to that? So I think that there, you're right. I think that if there was some document that was more evidence-based, I think that w- would really help because as we've talked about before on social media, things can get a, l- a little skewed and it's hard to sort of decipher what to trust. Yeah. And I think, well, uh, just speaking to the pineapple thing, a lot of people just get itchy in their mouth. And again, it, it's most commonly oral allergy syndrome and right. it's not a true anaphylactic reaction to pineapple, the proteins in pineapple. I I would say that for any foods, and I tell my patients this, for any foods that you're worried about that you're all of a sudden restricting yourself towards, they just because you're worried that you could be allergic because you've heard of other people being allergic, I always want them to come in. If I have a test available, we'll do the test. We'll send them for the test if I don't have it in my office. We'll do whatever we can if it exists. And then from there... We can also do an in-office challenge to the food where I'm there, you're there, and we can kind of expose your child to that food together so that you're not by yourself at home trying to do it. And I'll do it in a very methodical way that if at any point we start having a reaction, we just stop and then that's it. I think that that message is super important too, that just speaking for myself, but I think most allergists are open to doing that so that we don't have further restrictions on patients and kids and all that and families. Cause I am pretty sure that you, you would probably do fine with, she would probably do fine with pineapples just as an off. <laughs> just I agree. Comment. Yeah. So, and it's, it's been in our plan to eventually take her in because I, I don't like that idea of restricting food that she may not be allergic to either. So thank you for that. Yeah, it just makes it easier for everyone, you know, and it just gives her more opportunities to try different flavors. And I think exactly. I think that's so important for kids or for people in general, just to not restrict themselves further in anything. Yeah, that's what I started doing uh, three years ago. I went into my allergist and I was like, this is the list of things I'm not eating right now. I would love to see if we can make it smaller. And they've really helped me you know, get more confidence in trying things at home as well. They did tests and then they were like, okay, this is the things that you can try. And I still get really nervous, but they gave me really good protocols to do it. So I think it really is just about also finding your comfort level and doing it at home, which is really hard. Like I kind of do a whole ritual if I'm in adding a new food into my diet. I'd be like, when did I last exercise? Did I take anything that could, you know, aspirin, which I don't generally take? Definitely no alcohol. I've only eaten food that I normally eat. Like I have these things just to calm my nerves at the same time. Yes. So important, but I think so different to do it as a young adult versus a parent of a child. And and both are very similar, but I think parents just get even more nervous sometimes, you know, because then they're kind of exposing their child to something that maybe they don't need to be exposed to or they're not asking to be exposed to, you know. So that's why I think in either situation, because I've had young adults come in or older adults or come in for that same thing of, you know what, I just don't feel comfortable doing this on my own. So I'm going to do it here with you. And I love it. It's just, it's, it's exciting. Undiagnosing a food allergy, like I said so many times, is my favorite thing to do because I just feel like I'm opening up this experience for people. So I think, and I, I'm assuming most allergists feel the same way. We would love to help you make that list shorter. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, you know, when she was, when she took her testing for the nut, all tree nuts, she was eating, like I said, a few nuts before. And then the almonds, the almond was a little iffy because I was feeding that to her before the testing as well. And it was sort of borderline, but we kept her away from almonds for like years. And then finally, we took her back to the allergist around the time that the sesame uh, was an issue. And, 
you know, the doctor said, you know, you can reintroduce this back in. We'll do an oral challenge in the office. And she did and she passed. And it was just so exciting to bring that back into our house because that's the one nut that we can eat. And, you know, it just made such a huge difference for her. She was just so happy about it. And even to this day, oh, I can eat almonds. Isn't that great? That's like the one, you know, the one thing that I can you know, focus on. So I think that that is so true. What you're saying is that it just opens up a world for you. Yeah. That's so common without almonds, by the way. Yeah. I mean, it's not just so, you. So sometimes I just say at home, maybe you could do this and outside, maybe you could do this until the child becomes old enough to know the differences themselves and is able to advocate for themselves and understand, yes, I know I can have this and I know I can't have that. When when we're out, we don't um, eat almonds, but at home, we order them from a specific company that isn't cross-contaminated with other nuts. I think that's the issue for us is that she's very sensitive to that. So we know that that brand is safe. And even if, let's say, my sister is making a tart or something and she wants to use almonds, I provide the nuts, the almond brand that we use for my sister because of that issue with cross-contamination. So it's very sort of controlled in a way, but um, at home, it's just what we do. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I still get really itchy mouth when I eat almonds and I just don't find it very comfortable because I passed an oral challenge for almonds as well. But I know that here in Germany, I haven't found a safe almond at all. Like they all may contain either sesame or other tree nuts or even peanuts. So it's just, you know, I already have a little bit of an itchy mouth when I do eat them and I just avoid any circumstance where it could be a cross-contamination thing and then I'd be nervous anyways eating almonds not at home. I think it's again, it's about finding that comfort level. Yeah, and that makes so much sense that you would be nervous if you have itching in your mouth uh, that you wouldn't want to try anything that kind of starts off a reaction that you don't know if it's going to get worse or if it's just going to stay like that. So I think that this has been so helpful and all of these points are so important to remember. And now I I guess I want to get back into the fun food aspect and not the scary food aspect and just have Shala, you and Courtney as a young adult, I just want to talk about how you guys have made food fun for yourselves and for your children by using your kitchens. I think that's the part that I I think would be really nice and helpful for parents and for other young adults just to see how food can be so fun. I just have to say that when I visited Shala, it was like taking me back to my childhood when we were all in her kitchen and everyone was, we were making brownies. Yeah, we were making brownies. And I just felt like this is what I used to do with my mom when I was a kid at the weekend. And I remember when I left home for university, my sister and my mom were like, we've all lost 10 pounds because we're not making cookies every night. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I would love to hear more about what Shala has to say about bringing cooking and this like positive spin on it into her children's lives because I feel like my mom did that and it's definitely inspired me to cook a lot more now um, and to feel adventurous in the kitchen but yeah I would like to hear the mom's perspective. I love that. Thank you for sharing that, Courtney. Well, yeah, you know, my kids love to cook. Cyrus always had this love of baking and cooking early on and it was just, you know, the kitchen is a central hub of your your home and even though I didn't start out as a cook, um, you know, I just, I just loved food so much. And I think that love just sort of transfers to your kids. You can't help for it to be contagious in a way. Um, you know, the volume of cooking is a lot that we do in our house. And sometimes that can be burdensome, but you know, we've worked around those ways by batch cooking and, um, just, you know, finding different hacks and stuff. So I think that, there still is this love of cooking that we share together. And I also think that when you have certain dietary requirements and food restrictions, I think that it's so easy to go and, you know, focus on the negative of it. Like I can't 
order takeout Chinese food or I can't go to the bakery anymore. You know, I had this whole vision before I became um, a mother when I was pregnant who would be so central in our lives. And we would, you know, go to the ice cream shop and I would take my kids to the bakery. And we did a lot of that with Alina when she was little. And then when it was taken away because of her food allergies, I felt such a deep loss from all of that. And I felt really lost. And I thought, how, how is this going to be? Like, what kind of life are we going to be able to live? You know, because I had experienced all these joys of uh, eating out and I was such a food oriented person, but I think bringing it into the kitchen, it was just natural for me. And like I said, I just didn't want there to be any fear associated with the food that we could eat. And Syra just had a love of baking. And I think part of it too, as a sister of someone, she doesn't have food allergies, but her sister does. And so, you know, we just said, if we can't go to a bakery, we're just going to try to recreate it at home. And so it just became sort of this fun thing. And I just let her experiment in the kitchen. And a lot of times I'll get messages from parents, like, how can you let your kids cook in the kitchen all the time, you know, from non food allergy uh, parents. And I think it's just for me, they have to learn how to cook. You know, it's part of empowering them to manage their allergies, whether it be environmental or food. And so to me, it's more of empowering them to learn how to do that. And we just have so much fun, you know, and so we have like, weekends we'll do like Chinese night on Sunday and you know we can't order sushi anymore so we'll have sushi night and none of it is perfect (laughs) by any means but it's just so much fun to see them and so I think it has helped especially with Alina it has helped to instill some joy in her because you know now as she gets older she's definitely more aware of how food impacts her in her social life so you know she'll make comments like well we can't eat it out but but we definitely can make it at home and it even tastes better when we make it at home. So that's really sweet. She doesn't know a difference, right? <laughs> she doesn't know what it tastes like in a bakery. So it's sweet. I think that's, that's great that she already has that attitude. Cause I think a lot of the times I'll go out for dinner and like my husband will be eating something. I'll be like, can you describe every flavor in that so we can go home and recreate it? Or I just want to get a feel. I just want to understand what's going on in that dish. And it's like, I'm making him become an investigator of the plate because I'm like, well, does it taste a little bit salty? What's the texture like? And it's just that joy of, of having that empowerment in the kitchen. You don't feel like you're missing out because you feel like, okay, now I kind of, I know food well enough that I can maybe think I can taste it in my mind or I can go home and recreate it. So I think that's a great gift that you're giving her. Oh, thank you. I mean, we try. It's not, it's not by any means on purpose. It's just sort of what we have to do, but it's really cute because Syra made Alina churros a few weeks ago for a birthday party that she was going to. They were serving donuts there. And so we thought we would recreate with churros. And we realized that Alina had never even eaten a churro before. She didn't even know what it tasted like. And so Syra and I were both trying to explain to her what it tasted like before she tasted it. And then when she tasted it, she said, I have never had a churro but this just tastes delicious so, oh, that's so, so cool. really, yeah it was really sweet and so now she's begging her to make some more churros for her that's adorable and and I also want to preface that because I was listening you know I was a part of your Instagram live the other day even though I didn't get to hear every part of it but you had mentioned that there are safe ways to eat out too and there's you know now we live in a time that is pretty awesome in the sense that people are becoming more aware and there are websites that like the allergy eats, I think you had mentioned that has great resources so that people can eat out. Yeah. And I think what Laura and I, um, my friend Laura, who writes the blog on Paula Rain, we were both talking about, it's all based on your comfort level too. You know, we have a few safe places that we go to that do not have any of our allergens and we haven't really delved too much into uh, you know, other places, but I know Al, a uh, Courtney and, uh, Allie from Miss Allergic Reactor, they, you know, you guys have talked quite a bit about dining out with the use of chef cards. And, you know, that's something that we plan on, uh, bringing with us when we travel this summer. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's based on your comfort level. And I think you're right. I think that uh, restaurants are definitely becoming more allergy aware. Uh, we hope that, you know, it just continues forward with that yeah I it was it's funny because 
as we talked about, I'm learning so much from the Instagram community, but but so is my husband <laughs> through me. And, you know, we were, I'm going to post about this, but recently we were on vacation in Italy. And even right when we got in the plane, I think they served us something that had peanut in it or something. And he's like, oh my God, babe, it has peanut in it. And he was actually looking at the ingredients. We don't, I don't have food allergies. He doesn't have food allergies, but he's become so sensitive and every restaurant we went to where they were very allergy aware, he would point it out and make a point to just say, this is really cool. And this uh-huh. is so nice that they're doing this. So, um, so it's just, yeah, there, and there's so many instances where they don't do a good job. So, so when you notice the restaurants that are trying to do a good job, it's just so it's, it's great. Yeah. I, I mean, I always say that allergy people are the most loyal customers because if you're going to take time to like make sure that something's safe, then we'll we'll be back and we'll tell all our friends and we'll bring all our friends. And I have so many times where I go out to this, I have a handful of restaurants too. And then we all show them our chef cards and we're like, oh, we met because of allergies. And then the waiter's like, I figured there was something about that. Like why you guys all have these chef cards? Well, we went to, when we went to that pizza place, during the allergy and asthma network conference and you were so excited to share this pizza plate that you would find found that was so accommodating and literally like 10 people walked in with allergy <laughs> to this restaurant so they definitely got new customers because of you courtney so yeah I, I can see how that would bring business in for restaurants so they should be more aware of that <laughs> It's, yeah, it's just a really cool experience when you do find places where you feel safe. And it's about having, I mean, most places where I eat at, I contact them beforehand and explain to them my allergies. And then before I even eat there, like, so even when it's a place that I've been to a bunch of times, I'll let them know I'm coming so that the kitchen knows I'll be there because I don't want them to have to feel this pressure of catering to all my allergens especially if it's like a busy Friday night. So I just like to give them a little heads up. Oh, that's such a good idea. Makes me feel more comfortable, but I also think it's nice for the kitchen staff to know that at some point in their evening, their line is going to get interrupted because someone will have to get pulled off to cook my meal. They're going to accommodate you, but you need to accommodate them. So it's also working with the restaurant and asking them how can they do it safely and how can they do it without a lot of stress in their kitchen. Because when you come with a handful of food allergies like I do, you don't want to put people off. And you don't want the person cooking your meal cursing at you either. You just be like, oh, I can't believe like every other plate's going to be late now. And I want someone to be like worn and ready and happy to be cooking my meal for me. You're so smart, Courtney. That is so smart. And I totally agree because I've worked in so many restaurants. I've been a, a waitress since I was 16. And um, and the restaurant industry is very much like that. Like you, you have to be sensitive on both sides. You know, that is a great tip. And our conversation, maybe I want to ask Shala, what is your tip for newly diagnosed moms and how to enter this if you're not already, you know, a chef and if you don't have time to do a cooking course like you had the perfect opportune time to do, how do you tell people to go about doing that? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think that cooking can be really intimidating for people. And I think when you're newly diagnosed, there's just so much to think about and order to keep your child safe. And that can in itself just be overwhelming. And then the amount of cooking that you have to do is overwhelming in itself. So it just all feels like a lot to take on right away. And then if you're not used to cooking all the time, I think that that can be uh, intimidating. But what I want to stress is that, you know, Instagram if you scroll on Instagram, there's all this pressure to have like beautiful photos of food. And that's just not real life. Real life is just about, you know, making food with love. And if it's not perfect, it's okay. You know, it cooking takes lots and lots of practice. And even with someone who has the most amount of talent, that person has spent years and years in the kitchen. And so I would just suggest just getting in the kitchen and starting with really simple meals, you know, a roast, you know, chicken, whatever your allergies are based on those requirements, just getting in the kitchen and cooking something simple. Um, these days there's so much out there as far as tutorials and YouTube and, um, you know, you can Google 
very simple recipes and, and videos to teach you how to do that. And I think that if you just learn basic elements of cooking, then it will make that burden seem so much more enjoyable. And I think that's the, the key with all of this is that, yes, we do have to spend more time in the kitchen and we adjust our life to do that. But there also should be this sort of joy that comes with that. And it's just a gift to be able to pass that to our kids because I don't know, for me, you know, that's just really important to pass on to my daughter so that she can empower herself and want to cook for herself someday and make those safe choices as well. So uh, definitely, you know, don't be hard on yourself. I've had so many failures in the kitchen and still continue to. And I feel like with cooking, it's just endless, the amount of things to learn. Yeah, that's great advice. And I think a part, Courtney, a part of our blog post, we can definitely share some of the sites that Shala loves and that you love of different go-to sites where they provide those simple recipes like your Instagram Shala and your blog. Um, I would love to just provide those links. You know, I think that's what people come to the podcast for too, is just good recommendations of people that are doing it right and making things easier for them in their home. Absolutely. It's really important to find those few staples that are your go-tos, you know, so you feel like you always have a reliable recipe in your back pocket. Yeah. Yeah, I think for us, like we've really relied on batch cooking in our house, you know, making things ahead so that that burden of cooking isn't always on you. You know, living this allergy life, so much comes up in your day to day and we still have to live life, right? Like we have to go to soccer practice and, you know, dance classes and school. And, but then we also have this component that we're managing and that's a big component of our life, which shouldn't define us, but we have to also sort of manage that. And so for us, like we've found really helpful to batch cook a lot of our meals. We bought a freezer that we store in our garage, which not everyone can do. But, you know, if you can even find things that work for you, whether it be like an instant pot, I know Meg has her new book out about the instant pot and that works wonderful. We do that as well. And I think those little hacks make it more enjoyable as well, because you're not spending like every single minute in the kitchen. I think that's great too. And maybe I have you done a blog post on that? I yeah, you know, I have been trying to figure out how to because a lot of my uh posts, uh recipe posts have been uh, uh specifically focused on like salads and appetizers and desserts. And I actually was talking to a friend and saying people probably don't think I have dinner. <laughs> Well, I really, we really do eat dinner. It's just our dinner is so different because primarily that's how we cook is we batch cook. And okay. a lot of meals that we're making are portioned out and then we freeze them. And uh, so maybe two to three times a week we have a batch cooked meal or, or we'll have it through the week. So it's a little different way of cooking, but that's just what works for our family. And that doesn't mean that it'll work for every family, but it's just sort of how we survive. So I, I want to share that. I have to figure out a way to do that, but definitely that's in the plan. Oh, I think that would be amazing. And hopefully um, your blog post will be ready for when this episode comes out. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. This has been such a fun conversation. Super informative. I've learned a lot. You've just provided so much amazing information today. Thank you so much for having me, ladies. I've just had so much fun too. Thanks, Shala. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Remember that all information you hear today is for informational purposes only and are not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified physician or healthcare provider. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have a second, help spread the word by rating our podcast and sharing with your friends and family who might also be interested in learning more about allergies, asthma, and immunology. You can always stay up to date by checking out our Instagram, The Itch Podcast, where you can leave questions you are itching to know, or check out our website, which is www.itchpodcast.com, which contains more information about the subjects we covered in today's episode and every episode. Until next time, have a fabulous week.